제임스 레니 어, 강좌 시리즈는 연세대학교 통일연구원이 메디치 미디아와 그리고 미국의 태평양 세계 연구소와 공동으로 해서 전 주한미 대사를 지낸 제임스 레니 박사를 기리기 위해서 만든 것입니다. 제임스 레니 박사는 에머리 어, 대학 총장도 지내셨고 그리고 1993년부터 97년까지 주한미 대사를 지내셨습니다. 한미 관계에도 큰 공헌을 하셨고 1994년 1차 북한 핵위기 때 대사로 계시면서 상당히 공헌을 많이 했습니다. 그래서 그분을 기리기 위해서 연세대학교와 태평양 세계연구소가 제임스 레니 석자 교수제를 만들었습니다. 제임스 레니 석자 교수제 의 프로그램의 일환으로 미국과 세계라는 주제의 제임스 레니 강좌를 준비하게 되었습니다. 상당히 새로운 획기적인 접근인데요. 이 강좌가 온라인과 오프라인으로 동시에 진행 예정인데 오늘날 미국 외교 정책의 주요 쟁점들 다 다룰 것입니다. 아마 이 강좌를 들으시게 되면 은 미국의 외교 정책 그리고 한반도와 관련된 것들에 대해서 가장 최근 업데이트되고 가장 그 이론과 실물을 겸한 아주 절충적인 이해를 할수 있다고 생각이 됩니다. 아마 한국에서 보기 드문 그런 강좌가 될 것입니다. 오늘 강의를 해주실 분은 찰스 쿱찬 조지타운대 교수입니다. 찰스 쿱찬 교수가 오늘 발표할 내용은 미국의 외교 정책은 실패하고 있는가? 아마 미국의 외교 정책이 상당히 비판적으로 보는 그런 강의가 될 것입니다. 그러나 찰스 쿱찬 교수는 상당히 낙관주의적인 학자이시기 때문에 하나의 좋은 대안도 제시할 것으로 봅니다. 그분은 이제 프린스턴 대학교 조교수로 시작해서 조지타운 대학교 교수로 있는데 클린턴 행정부에서도 백악관에서 유럽 담당 국장을 맡았었고요. 오바마 행정부 때는 아예 유럽 담당 선임 국장을 지냈고 그리고 대, 대통령 특별 보좌관을 했는데 주로 담당했던 분야가 유럽 분야입니다. 이론과 실질을 다 더불어 갖춘 아주 그러한 미국 외교 정책의 전문가라고 평가할 수 있을 겁니다. 아, 기대해 보셔도 좋을 것입니다. And also we have, you know, Professor Charles Kupchan, uh, who is a distinct speaker of today. Okay. As you all know, you know, James T. Lanny lecture series was created by Yonsei University with the support from Pacific Century Institute to commemorate contribution of Ambassador Lenny, who served as ambassador, American ambassador to uh, Republic, Republic of Korea in 1990s. Okay. He made a great contribution uh, to uh, allocate U.S. relations okay. as a president of uh, Emory University, as well as ambassador to uh, Seoul. He was also a professor of theology at the Yonsei College of Theology from 1958 to 1964. Therefore, he has a first-hand knowledge of Korea. And also, uh, you might recall that he made a very important contribution uh, to avert the first nuclear crisis on the Korean Peninsula in 1994, when he was ambassador to Seoul. Uh, therefore, uh, it is a great uh, honor and pleasure for Yonsei University to create uh, a lecture in honor of uh, Ambassador Lenny. Uh, we'll be you know, running 12 lectures through, throughout the year, and therefore the first speaker of this series is uh, Professor Charles Kupchan. Uh, professor Kupchan is a professor of international affairs at Georgetown University, and also he's a senior uh, fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, you should have read his articles and books in various in the places, particularly he is a regular contributor, contributor to foreign affairs, uh, the distinguished in a, the Journal of Council on Foreign Relations. He also uh, served as a senior director for European affairs, as well as a special assistant to President Obama for European affairs in the White House. Therefore, he has a first-hand knowledge of American foreign policy. Uh, 
he you know, published very, very influential books. You know, there are so many, but the two cite few, uh, like No One's World, which really you know, underscores the importance of changing global power configuration. And another most recent book is about uh, isolationism. You know, how I think that he should have written a book uh, with regard to the advent of the Trump administration. You know, the, why America has been returning to idealism, what has been history of idealism in the U.S. And with this background, you know, I would like to run this uh, uh, lecture uh, in the following way. Uh, Professor Charles Kupchan will give about 10 minute brief uh, lecture on is American foreign policy failing? And then that will be followed by about the 30 to 40 minute questions and answer session between me and Professor Kupchan. And then I'll f open the lecture to the floor. That you, can raise, uh, uh, you can raise your questions. Uh, in raising questions, uh, Sojin will be running it, but uh, you can raise your hand uh, by using you know, the cursor. And then I'll pick it up, and then uh, you'll uh, raise your questions, and Professor Kupchan will respond to your questions, OK? Okay, with this uh, administrative note, let me invite the Professor Charles Kupchen. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Moon. It's, it's uh, my honor to uh, help you launch the lecture series that uh, you've created in honor of, of Ambassador Laney. Uh, it's also wonderful to see you. Uh, we've been friends for, for several decades, and it's a pleasure to join you. Uh, uh, unfortunately, through virtual, uh, but uh, one of these days, I hope to see you again in, in person. Uh, I'm going to try to be quite brief uh, because I'd, I'd like to reserve as much time as possible for our conversation and for questions from the, from the participants. Uh, and I think what I'll do is, is begin from the beginning, and that is to, to go back to early American history. And I want to suggest that the United States has gone through phases of very coherent and effective foreign policy uh, and other phases in which the United States has had a much more difficult time arriving at a clear and effective grand strategy. The first period, I would, I would argue, ran from the founding in 1789 until 1898. And during that period, the United States had a, a grand strategy of pushing other major powers out of its neighborhood and building a strong and stable union that stretched from the Atlantic and the Pacific. It was quite brutal and expansionist when it came to indigenous Americans grabbing land as it moved westward, also launched a war that entailed a land grab from Mexico. But there was a consensus to go no further. Uh, and that isolationism, that conviction that the United States should stay put and not, uh, as, as many of the founders said, get entangled in the affairs of Europe or entangled far afield, was a successful strategy. It allowed the United States to rise in largely unmolested fashion. The second phase, lasted from 1898 to 1941. And this was a phase of incoherence, of fits and starts. First, the United States tries a very realist brand of expansionism, imperialism, in the Spanish-American War, taking over Spanish territories in the Caribbean and the Pacific. America as a republic says, we don't like this and it begins to pull back to a more isolationist stance. Woodrow Wilson then says, well, if we can't be a realist power, then we'll be an idealist power. And he launches America into World War I to make the world safe for democracy. His brand of idealist internationalism also failed when the Senate rejected US participation in the League of Nations and the 1920s and the 1930s were two of the most inward-looking decades in American history, in which the United States effectively watched 
as war engulfed both Europe and Asia, refusing to participate to contain Imperial Japan or Nazi Germany until attacked at Pearl Harbor in 1941. That brought that period of inconstancy and indecision to an end, and it opened what I would call the most successful era in American internationalism that started on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, and effectively lasted until the end of the Cold War. And American foreign policy was steady, and it was purposeful, and it was based, in my mind, on two key ingredients. One, a balance between realism and idealism forged by Franklin Roosevelt, and reflecting the fact that the United States faced a counterweight in the world in the form of the Soviet Union. And the United States attempted to spread its ideals, American exceptionalism, spread the gospel of democracy and liberty, but it did so in a very patient way in which it recognized spheres of influence abroad and waited out the Soviet Union because it needed to avoid the costs of a possible war with a nuclear armed Soviet Union. The other key ingredient was domestic consensus, a strong middle, an ideological center comprised of centrist Democrats and centrist Republicans that essentially emerged on the back of the economic boom that followed World War II. America was an industrial power at the time. Its middle class was thriving. American internationalism paid dividends through trade and investment abroad. And there was a bipartisan consensus behind this mix of realism and idealism forged by Franklin Roosevelt and furthered by all the presidents that followed him, really in many respects up until the election of Donald Trump. I end that period of liberal internationalism and domestic consensus, however, in the 1990s, well before Trump, because I think two things transpired in the 1990s that brought that era of a successful grand strategy to an end. One was the United States was no longer checked. There was no counterweight. This is the unipolar era. And as a consequence, in my mind, idealist aspirations were no longer checked by realist realities. And it was in the 1990s that I think the United States engaged in ideological and strategic overreach. Overreach at home by letting the market reign free, by engaging in globalization, automation, in ways that began to erode the American middle class, which had already be, been eroding because of the introduction of the digital era. And we really began to see uh, abroad in America that through the expansion of NATO, EU, Russia into the G7, China into the WTO, and then after 9-11, the forever wars in the Middle East, an America that really thought that it could go out and when necessary, use force to spread the American gospel, to realize the dream of American exceptionalism. And I think the United States bit off more than it could chew. And it was in many respects, liberal overreach at home and abroad that led to the Trump era. And the other thing that happened in the 1990s, beginning with the 94 loss of Congress by the, by the Democrats, by Mr. Clinton, is the hollowing out of the political center. Starting in 1994 and expediting ever since, the Republican Party has moved to the right, the Democratic Party has moved to the left, and there's no one standing in the middle. And that makes it very hard for the United States to conduct a coherent grand strategy, because it means that when power changes hands in Washington, US foreign policy swings quite wildly. We went from George W. Bush to President Obama, from President Obama to President Trump, from President Trump to Joe Biden. 
different parties have very different approaches to the conduct of statecraft. And it has led to a very erratic and inconstant grand strategy really going back to the 1990s. That then brings me to the Trump era and the Biden course correction. I think Donald Trump was in many respects a reaction to the liberal overreach of the post-Cold War era. A liberal overreach that led to the hollowing out of the American middle class and that led to overreach and wars in the Middle East, what we now call the forever wars, that were enormously costly but led to little good. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and I think the American people had had enough of it. And Donald Trump was in many respects a reaction to the, a primal scream in the American electorate that said, too much world, not enough America. What about us? Why are we building schools in Kandahar when we should be building them in Kansas? And Trump, many respects, a very talented politician, was able to tap into the politics of grievance and a pursue an America first foreign policy with neo isolationist inclinations that harken back to the hardcore isolationism of the America First Committee that opened its doors in 1940 to block US entry into World War II. Joe Biden then comes after Trump, and in many respects, he attempts to pull off a course correction not to go fully back to where the United States was before Trump, because, because that was impossible, but to try to repair America's relations with its allies and to continue the investment in the American middle class. Biden's foreign policy for the middle class was in many respects his counterpart to America first, the pursuit of an American foreign policy that would speak to the broad cross-section of the American electorate that feels that it is on the losing end of globalization and that feels that the system has not worked for them. And I think Biden got off to a very good start, focused on the home front, in my mind, correctly withdrew from Afghanistan, even though the implementation did not go well. But then to some extent, he has been knocked off his agenda by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has been the focal point of Biden since last February. And it has returned the United States to a foreign policy that is in many respects anchored by a new geopolitical division between East and West, except in this case, East comprises not just Russia, Soviet Union, but also China which in many respects makes this new because during most of the Cold War, China and Russia were at odds. Now they form a strategic partnership. I think in broad brushstrokes, Biden's foreign policy has been effective. The assistance to Ukraine has succeeded in rebuffing the Russian invasion. But I would offer the following concerns about where we go from here. Number one, the offensive in Ukraine has not gone as well as expected. A Ukrainian victory and an expulsion of Russian troops from the country looks unlikely. Where does the war go from here, especially at a moment in which Republicans are raising serious concerns about continued aid to Ukraine? at previous levels. Number two, I understand the reason for strong confrontational policies toward Russia and China, Russia in particular, but I also believe that we are headed into a period of what I would call globalized multipolarity, in which an American strategy focused solely on its democratic partners and partnerships with our traditional allies will not be sufficient 
to govern a world in which we need cooperation across ideological dividing lines to deal with climate change, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, cybersecurity, you name it. There is a long, long list. And yes, we need to stand up to China. Yes, we need to push back against China's policies at home and its expansionary policies abroad. But we also need to find a way of governing a world which will come undone if we don't find ways to cooperate across ideological dividing lines. A second or a third concern here is the global south. And I think we are experiencing what I would call a political awakening from Southeast Asia to South Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Latin America. It is to me enormously revealing that most of the world amid the war in Ukraine is not choosing sides. I think we're headed into a period in history in which many major rising countries, India, Turkey, Brazil, Indonesia, are going to be navigating East-West rivalry and not neatly taking their place with either camp. That means that the West needs to raise its game when it comes to its engagement with the global South. My final concern is about America and America's domestic politics. I cannot say with confidence that the Trump era is behind us. Trump appears to be the likely candidate for the Republican Party. It's probably more likely than not that Biden would be able to beat Trump. But we still live in an America that is profoundly polarized and in which the political center is deeply weakened from what it was. And I would make the same argument about democracies on the other side of the Atlantic. The United Kingdom has been tied up in political knots really ever since Brexit. The most popular candidate in polls in France today is Marine Le Pen. In Germany, the alternatives for Germany are rising in the electoral polls. I don't expect to see Germany's political center go the way of the political center in other liberal democracies, but all is not well in the German political system at a time when inflation is high, energy prices are high, and the far right is gaining steam. In my mind, the first, second, and third priorities for the United States have to be to get our own house in order. Because I'm confident that if the United States and its core allies in Europe and Asia are able to revitalize their economies and revitalize the legitimacy of their democratic institutions, we collectively will be able to face down Russia, China, or whatever else comes our way. But I cannot predict with confidence that that revitalization will take place. And that's why I would end my opening remarks by saying that strength starts at home. The United States needs to address its grand strategy by getting its economic house in order, by getting its political house in order, and going back to being a country that provides steady and purposeful and centrist leadership, and that again is a country that many around the world aspire to emulate. Chang-in, I will stop there. Thank you, Charleston. What a wonderful lecture. Let me just start with the first question. What is the grand strategy? Has really U.S. created grand strategy in very meaningful and systematic way? Or is it simply response to changing, uh, you know, uh, changing world order uh, or the new challenges coming from outside? I mean, I think I think countries should have grand strategies. Uh, I take a grand strategy to be the intellectual framework, the blueprint, the architecture that guides states in a complicated world. 
we generally think about great powers of having as having grand strategies, but smaller powers do as well. South Korea has a grand strategy. At least I hope it has a grand strategy. Maybe we can talk about that. Uh, Switzerland, a small power, has a grand strategy. And I think that in many respects, one has to come at the world with a set of guiding suppositions. Where are the fault lines? What are the key forces that need to be contended with? What is the nature of change in the distribution of power? I think, for example, that we are now at the cusp of really a profound shift of a sort we have not seen in several hundred years. And that's because it was after the 1700s, amid the industrial and capitalist revolution, that power swung from east to west. And really, ever since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, globalization and interdependence has been anchored by either Northwestern Europe or North America, and more recently, the two together. And that was in part because the democratic world that emerged from the Industrial Revolution represented 75 to 80 percent of global GDP. The Soviet Union at the height never represented more than 55 percent of American GDP. Well, that's not going to be the case moving forward. If you look at projections for where the global economy will be in the second half of this decade, the number one economy will be China. The number two economy will be India. The number three economy will be the United States. Number four is expected to be Indonesia. That's a brave new world. We need to see that coming. We need to understand that the the globe is changing, and that has to figure into the map of the world that we use to guide grand strategy. But however, you know, but if you look at the American foreign policy behavior since the end of the Cold War, American policy has been rather reactive rather than proactive, other than perhaps the Clinton period. Clinton period has, and it was a unipolar world, you know, Clinton administration has a clear vision of so-called engagement and enlargement. But afterwards, 9-11, then American foreign policy was, has become reactive to 9-11. And all of a sudden, rise of China. American policy has been response to you know, Chinese rise. Now we have a Russian invasion of Ukraine, and American policy has been geared to how to deal with this you know, tragic incident in Europe. Don't you think that the U.S. has been dictated by what is happening outside rather than internally coherent and, you know, sustainable in a grand strategy? Well, I, I think it's it's been some of both. And grand strategy on some level needs to be reactive because it's a dynamic blueprint, right? It needs to adapt to incoming information. It needs to adapt to changes in technology. It needs to adapt to changes in the distribution of power. But I, I, my critique would be less that it's, that it's been re reactive than in it has, in many respects, overdone it. Uh, I, I think in the, in the 1990s, we had a chance, we had a chance to do better. We had a chance to, uh, to, to I think, build a post-Cold War order that made Russia a stakeholder. Uh, in my mind, I think the enlargement of NATO was a mistake. We were asking for trouble by taking the world's most formidable alliance and moving it ever closer to Russia's borders. That doesn't mean that I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine was justified, it was not, it was a, an illegal act of brutal aggression. But I think we made some strategic mistakes in that era, including, including by flinging open the, uh, the domestic economy and really letting, letting the market rule in, in ways that came back to haunt us. 
led to a new grand strategy. The neoconservatives were in charge. They were going to transform the Middle East. We were turning Afghanistan and Iraq into Ohio. They really believed it. They really believed that we were sending American troops into Afghanistan and Iraq, and they would turn into stable liberal democracies, right? This was uh, ideological hubris that in many respects led to decades of instability in the region for which we and many other parts of the world are still paying a price. And I would make the same argument about Ukraine. I think the response that Mr. Biden has put together has been extraordinary. It's admirable. But at the same time, we need to make sure that American interests in Ukraine are in sync with the level of our commitment. This is a war that could escalate to a direct war between NATO and Russia. This is a war that could go nuclear. I think we have to be very careful about how we handle the end game. Charles, you have been working with the Council on Foreign Relations quite some, quite some time. And I was shocked to read uh, in a New York Times interview uh, by Richard Haas, former president of Council on Foreign Relations. In fact, he served as a president of Council on Foreign Relations uh, you know, 20, you know, sub 20 years. You know. But in his interview with the New York Times on July 1st, he said that uh, the greatest danger to the world security is the United States. It is us. What did you take on his statement? It was quite, you know, astounding to all of South Koreans. You know, the president of Council on Foreign Relations saying that America is a real source of problem from world peace and security. Do you, first, do you agree with the, his you know, argument? Well, I, I think we shouldn't take the comment in out of context. My guess is that he was referring to American domestic politics. Uh, and that's because, as you know, he recently wrote a book called The Bill of Obligations, and it's very much about civics and the responsibility to contribute to the American uh, uh, the American mission in a, in a responsible and effective way. Um, I, I, you know, is America a uh, a source of instability, aggression? Absolutely not, in my mind. I think, on balance, the world has become a much better place since the United States showed up. When the U.S. became a liberal democracy, very, very few countries around the world were liberal democracies. And little by little, both by emulation and in some cases through the use of force, like in World War II, the United States has succeeded in making the world more liberal, more democratic, more prosperous, more free. That doesn't mean that we make mistakes. We do. We make plenty of mistakes. But I think on balance, the United States has been a force of good in the world. Where I think Richard and I agree is that the greatest danger right now to the United States is not Vladimir Putin. It's not Xi Jinping. It's not Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. It is dysfunction. It is polarization. It is the possibility that we have seen the high watermark of the liberal democratic experiment. I don't believe that to be the case. I think the United States is an extraordinarily resilient place. I think that democracy has demonstrated its ability to self-correct and to bounce back. But I can say, uh, Chung In, with all honesty, as someone who lives in Washington, D.C., who has been in Washington, D.C. for 25 years, living through the Trump presidency was one hell of a scary experience, right? Because I saw that the liberal democracy is fragile, that liberal democracy needs care and feeding, 
that liberal democracy, if it falls into the wrong hands, can turn dark. And that, I'm, I don't want to put words into Richard Haas's mouth. I'll speak only for myself. But that, that is what keeps me up at night. We can talk about in a Trump our Trump administration in separate occasion. In fact, we'll be inviting you know, World Committee to talk about you know, conservative views of American foreign policy. But uh, let us t stick to the, in the Biden administration. Do you think that his foreign policy is performing well? Biden has, in many respects, continued the best of Trump. And one sees Biden as a counterpoise, as a swing away from Trump. But it's important to keep in mind that some of what Trump implemented, Biden continued. And that's because he's getting the same demand signals from the American electorate. One, the withdrawal and strategic retrenchment from the Middle East. And two, trade policies that are protectionist, that reinstate what I would call industrial policy when it comes to semiconductors and bringing manufacturing back to the United States and tariffs against China. I think the most significant positive changes and, and the pivot away from Trump are to repair America's relationships with its allies, to return to multilateralism, and perhaps most importantly, to bring to the Oval Office someone who again understands liberal democracy, the rule of law, the importance of the United States taking a stand as a country that is willing to stand by the values that America stands for. Uh, that to me is, is, is critical. Uh, but as I said, I'm not entirely comfortable with certain aspects of Biden's foreign policy. I think it was a mistake to call the 21st century a struggle between democracy and autocracy. I don't think that was a, a, a useful way of labeling the situation. I think the intensity of competition with China was perhaps overdone. And I do think the Biden administration is attempting to damp it down in a responsible way. De-risking by preventing critical technology from going into Chinese hands, but not decoupling. But as I said, I do worry that we now live in a world that is so globalized and so interdependent that a geopolitical rift between the United States and China would cause irreparable damage. And it seems to me that the United States and China both need to realize that reality. Yeah, but you know, if, if you look at the reality, you know, no major issues have been resolved. North Korea nuclear is still there. You know, in a conflict and confrontation with China has been you know, deepening. The Russian-Ukrainian issue hasn't been resolved. Okay. Syria, though, the instability in the Middle East is still continuing. Therefore, in other words, the world has not changed despite the change of government in the U.S. from Trump to Biden. That is really worrisome. That is why we are calling that is America foreign policy declining or not performing well? What is your take on that? I think the world is getting more difficult. The problems out there are extraordinarily difficult to tackle. Uh, and I do think that it's important to recognize areas where Biden has had significant success, and that is repairing alliances, getting South Korea and Japan to work more closely together, forming the Quad, and fashioning a new relationship with India that I think will withstand the test of time. And I also think that even though I believe the, the strategy in Ukraine needs to start examining an end game 
a diplomatic endgame that may well not entail the full restoration of Ukrainian sovereignty, I think his policy there has been a success. Russia has been dealt a decisive strategic defeat already. Putin tried to swallow Ukraine and he has failed. Russia is going to pay a price for this invasion for decades to come. And Biden has done all of that without putting NATO boots on the ground, without having Russian forces and American forces come into direct conflict. So I think it's been handled extremely well, and I would not dismiss the importance of that outcome. One of the most you know, interesting book I read some time ago was Leslie Gelb's Power Rules. And if when I heard, when I read you know, Richard Haas in a New York Times interview, it instantly reminded me of Richard, Leslie Gelb's book, Power Rules. In that book, he argues that American foreign policy is failing because of three reasons. First, ideological rigidity at home, and second, uh, the po political polarization. It simply, he put the nasty politics in Washington, D.C. And third, uh, hubris, which you mentioned. Therefore, he was arguing that the American problem is not external challenges. It is internal contradictions and internal you know, failings. That has been the real source of American foreign policy. Do you agree with his argument? Um, Yes, yes. I mean, I uh, and and let me just say that Les Gelb who was the president of the CFR when I started working there was a was a great friend and and we all miss him, miss him terribly. Um, a lot of what what Les mentioned overlaps with some of the themes that I identified in my opening remarks, ideological rigidity and hubris, I think, go together. Uh, and, and I do think that the, you know, even though I stand by American ideals and I believe that in the end of the day, humans want dignity, humans want freedom, democratic societies have an intrinsic, inescapable advantage over non-democratic societies, and that is that people would rather live freely than not. Uh, and that to me is a, is a universal truth. But I think at times that, that um, ideological commitment has led us astray. And I think we need, and here I think Les and Richard Haas and I would agree, we need to make sure that I, our ideological ambitions are calibrated by realism. Uh, and as someone who is more of a realist than anything else, my main lament about American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War is there isn't enough realism. There wasn't enough realism in the 90s, after 9-11 and the Arab Spring, we thought we could jumpstart a French revolution in the Middle East. Uh, and, and now I think with, with, uh, with Biden perhaps overcorrected for Trump, portraying the 21st century as this great battle between democracy and autocracy. I don't think that's helpful. And in fact, now that we, the United States, are out there having to cooperate with non-democracies because we have to, that kind of ideological rigidity, even though it may sell well at home, doesn't help us navigate a world with ideological dividing lines and a world that in my own view is headed toward inescapable ideological diversity and pluralism. We may have thought in 1991 that history was ending that the liberal democratic world was being universalized, that life was getting boring. Well, I think we arrived at that conclusion a little prematurely. But I think 
Yes, as you pointed out, you know, Francis Fukuyama's end of history has become totally forced proposition. But uh, now there is a very, you know, perhaps systematic effort to, to revive ideological confrontation so that we, we, so that we can put, put back the world into the new, you know, Cold War. Do you buy that argument? Because now the whole the confrontation between China and the United States, a growing number of people have been arguing that it is becoming ideological. And on the one hand, the autocracy, communist autocracy in one hand, and uh, liberal democracy on the other hand. As you, you, you aptly pointed out, it is not the right way of doing it. But if you look at Washington, uh, you know, really, the growing number of you know, the Washington pundits have been emphasizing this ideological divide between Beijing and Washington, between Beijing and Moscow. Do you see real danger coming out of it? Do you think that uh, there will be uh, ideologically charged the new Cold War? I think it's 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 difficult to untangle the ideological from the geopolitical, in the sense that both are at play, and there's no question that we are in a new era of geopolitical contestation that is in some ways arrayed in concentric circles with the most intense competition in your neighborhood. And that's because we know from history that when great powers rise, their first major geopolitical ambition is to hold sway in their immediate neighborhood. That's what the United States did, declaring in 1823 the Monroe Doctrine, warding off European powers. China is in many respects pushing out, getting more aggressive, elbowing other countries, trying to hold greater sway in its neighborhood. And the United States is saying, we're not going anywhere. We're a Pacific power. We have allies. We will protect Taiwan and South Korea and Japan and Australia and others. And that's a geopolitical contest. And that geopolitical contest is now extending outward with the United States and the Europeans attempting to create some sort of counter to Belt and Road. And at the same time, there is an ideological overlay. China is an autocracy. China is a one-party state. China has very different values when it comes to human rights. But I do worry that this mix of ideology and geopolitical contestation are creating a pretty toxic mix. Here in Washington, there is really only one way to get bipartisanship, and that is to stand up and talk about the China threat. And the same thing is in many respects happening in China. So we're in this echo chamber where the United States says, we need to do this, this, and this. And then Xi Jinping says, you're containing and suppressing us. And then the United States says this, and the Chinese say that. This is exactly how the security dilemma works. This is exactly what happened to Britain and Germany between 1898 and 1914. So I think we need to be very careful here before this escalates to dangerous levels. But as you pointed out, you know, that kind of extremism uh, would take place in the absence of a political middle. But in the past, you used to have like a Senator Sam Nunn, Senator Richard Luger, or Scott Croft. You know, there used to be a lot of so-called the middle figures who combine idealism with realism. But in these days in Washington, you don't see, as you pointed out, on China, there is a really bipartisan. On Ukrainian issue, they tend to be, you know, in criticism of in Russia, there is a bipartisan consensus. But other than that, there is a extreme polarization in, in Washington, D.C. that can cripple American foreign policy. And, and particularly if, let's say, next year, if Trump get elected, the kinds of extremism and polarization will be different. What did you take on this 
domestic political phenomenon in the U.S.? Well, it, it is um, ever present. It's extraordinarily important in my mind. And it's about to get more intense. And that's because we are now heading into the main stretch of the presidential campaign. The Republican debates have already begun. There's been one. There's another one coming up. Trump is skipping it. And it's clear that the Republican Party is deeply divided between a hawkish wing and an America first wing. And it's interesting to me that the America first wing clearly has the upper hand. I thought it was very interesting that Ron DeSantis, who seems to be falling behind, but who was really the, the, the other main contender to Trump, when he had to decide as a political operative where to locate himself, he located himself with the America First crowd, with skepticism about more and more aid to Ukraine. And the reason that he did that is because that's what he's hearing from the Republican base. And so when you go out to red states, you do get a very different message than you do in coastal regions and more internationalist regions. And I would keep a close eye, Chung in on the debate that's taking place as, as we speak, not just on whether the government is going to shut down in a few days, but whether Congress approves 24 billion more in assistance to Ukraine. This is turning into a big fight, which is exposing cracks within the Republican Party. And I would add that even though the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is being quiet for now, we are now back in an, in an America in which there are these weird alliances between the far left and the far right. The progressive Democrats generally are uncomfortable with continued spending on Ukraine. They're less comfortable with, with a more ambitious, expensive foreign policy than centrist Democrats. And in many respects, they end up allying with far-right Republicans who have a different agenda. They're much more libertarian. But we've seen this strange alliance emerge several times in American history. In fact, going back to the 1890s, when they, an alliance between left and right formed against the Spanish-American War and the imperialism that followed. So yes, bottom line here, I would say that, that um, this is a unique period of polarization. The world is watching carefully. If Trump does get elected, I think it will be um, a game changer and that countries around the world will have no question but to ponder the reliability of the United States over the longer term. What is your general assessment of American foreign policy making in a system? It's a, on the one hand, we can say it is very democratic, but on the other hand, it can be extremely you know, uh, dysfunctional and uh, uh, in, in a sense, it's miserable, okay? What, what did you take on this American foreign policy making? I think it really does depend on the administration. I think this administration has a, a good functioning process, an interagency discussion that works its way up and eventually lands on President Biden's desk and he makes the final judgment. There was no process during the Trump presidency. It was broken. Uh, policy was made by tweet. Relatively high members of the administration didn't know what policy was until they read it on their smartphone. 
the bureaucracy was trying to play catch up. But that really is the exception more than the rule. Having worked in the White House, both under President Obama and President Clinton, I would say I came away with a, with a generally positive view of the policymaking process from those experiences. What did you then? What are your recommendations for better American foreign policy? You, you may recall that uh, uh, Richard Haas has been urging the restoration of democracy in the U.S. You know. Uh, and order in house, but on the other hand, you know, Radley Gelb has been arguing that uh, there got to be really restora- restoration of common sense, prudence, okay, and humility in the American foreign policy. Uh, what did your general, you know, uh, uh, what did you take on those, you know, on their recommendations? And also, if you look at the in the Bill of Obligations by you know, Richard Haas. He has been arguing that the citizens get you know, informed, you know, get involved in all these 10 propositions. You know. uh, uh, can you give your general ideas on how to improve American foreign policy making? I share many of, of Richard's concerns about getting citizens that are better informed and more responsible, teaching civics, in middle schools and high schools. I'm someone who thinks that a national service program would be quite useful because we don't have conscription anymore. A very small percentage of the American electorate serves in the military. And as a consequence, there isn't any real institution that brings Americans from different walks of life together. The public school system, to some extent, does that, but many families opt out of it. And we tend to live now in our little bubbles, our social bubbles. I am, I guess, more of an economic determinist than I am an institutionalist. I think that the main source of the problem here in the United States has to do with income. Inequality is a problem, but the bigger problem is how difficult it is to make ends meet. And I'll just throw out a few numbers. Back in the heyday of the industrial era, the largest employer in the United States was General Motors. The average wage of a General Motors worker was $30, $31 an hour. Today, the largest employer in the United States is Walmart. The average wage at Walmart is, I think, just above $10 an hour. It used to be below $10. I haven't checked for a while. Maybe it's closer to $12 or $13. But we're looking at an unbelievable decline in the average wage of the average American worker. And that has led to a sense of immobility, a sense of left behind, a sense that the American middle class dream is no longer available. And so I would focus very heavily on rebuilding the American middle class, worker retraining, education, getting broadband internet into the American heartland, helping with child care, helping with community college and college education. I think one can rebuild the American middle class. For me, that is the first step to rebuilding the political center. I would start there. And then as far as, as, as you know, my, my foreign policy agenda is concerned, you know, at the broadest level, it would be more realism less idealism, more recognition that we live in a world that is irretrievably globalized and work harder at trying to build cooperative or at least collaborative relationships with countries that may not share our values. Because it seems to me that if we don't do that, we are all going to sink together. Excellent. Now I'll open the discussion to the floor. You know, you can raise your hand. You can use the you know 
the cursor to raise your hand. Okay, who raised in the Dominique Phillips? Okay, yes. go ahead, Hi. Dominique. I do, uh, uh, introduce yourself first, okay? Hello, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Dominic Phillips. I'm currently at Yensei University uh, Underwood International College, and I major in IS, International Studies. So I guess my question was uh, to the professor, um, I think one of the main priorities of the Biden administration when it comes to foreign policy has been trying to repair and mend like alliances that become very became very strained under Trump. Um, but do you think the shadow of a potential return of Trump in 2024 is making it difficult for American America to seem credible on the world stage when it comes to these alliances? Or do you think that if Biden were to be reelected, that they would have more ability to uh, make long-term commitments in foreign policy? I mean, I, I think, Dominic, that I would give Biden maybe even a straight A for repairing the damage. I mean, he, he really it, it, it went the distance to treat traditional allies as equals and with respect. Yes, Afghanistan didn't go so well. Yes, there was AUKUS. We should have done our homework with the French before dropping the, the news about that submarine deal. But I would say overall, the level of consultation has been remarkable, especially around Ukraine, but not just Ukraine. And you could hear the sighs of relief everywhere. Do Germans and French and 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 South Koreans and maybe maybe Chung In would, uh, would would Professor Moon would weigh in on this? Do they worry about what comes next? Yes. You know, I've been in, in Europe a few times in the past few months, and everybody is asking the same thing. Is it possible that Trump could be reelected? If he is reelected, what will happen? Uh, and so, you know, as I said, I think it's I think it's unlikely, but it is not it, it, it is not sufficiently unlikely that we can we can rest well. <laughs> um what you know <clears throat> what happens if he if if he is elected let's not go there <laughs> <laughs> okay who is next uh elisa um first of all i'm sorry i'm sick <laughs> oh yeah don't um, worry about it uh, my name is elizabeth i'm a master's student at yonsei's university's graduate school of international studies and I major in international cooperation. And um, to the end of your the question Q and A part, you said that the U.S. needs uh, welfare and social policy, which I do agree on. But you argued that it would help America, kind of, for the U.S. Um, kind of go against the breaking of the middle class and kind of maybe work against the um, rising dichotomy in the society. And I was wondering because um, countries such as Germany, I'm, I'm from Germany, countries such as Germany and France do have the same problem now that people have this feeling of being left alone, feeling left behind, which um, country uh, parties such as the AFD, which you told about, or Marie Le Pen uh, greatly like instrumentalize and use to split society in these countries too, because the social welfare systems are apparently, even in countries such as Germany and France, not enough to work against this uh, development society is taking. Yeah, so I was wondering how you would evaluate that, looking at the US. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth, that's a, it's a great question. You know, in the first instance, I think that it's not surprising that the country's hardest hit by a liberal populism have been the Anglo-Saxon countries. And that's in part because their welfare systems are less generous than continental Europe. 
And also because they have, even though Britain has more than two parties, they're both sort of two party systems. And so here in the United States, if you're a pissed off voter on the right, you pull the Republicans to the right. And if you're an unhappy voter on the left, you pull the Democrats to the left. Whereas in Germany or Italy, you generally have a host of parties on the left and right that attract the anti-establishment vote. And that has left social Democrats and Christian Democrats in the center of the political spectrum, which is good a good thing in my mind, even though they are not getting the same vote share that they used to get. But you're right that even in continental Europe, where welfare states are more generous, you are seeing the same phenomenon of a liberal populism. And as a, as a consequence, I think you have to say, well, there are other things going on. One of them is immigration. And I do think that the United States and the EU do need to get functioning immigration policies in place. And Biden's immigration policy, he, he's tried various, various uh, approaches to this, but he is vulnerable uh, on this question, uh, in part because there isn't a sense that the United States has control over the over the southern border, that plays to the hands of the liberal populists who use racism either explicitly or implicitly as a political wedge issue. And I think also at play is social media. And social media is, is really creating alternative realities in our societies that make it very hard to sustain the common narratives uh, that that um, that help sustain political centrism. Um, final comment: I, I do think that, um, especially in in Germany, their economic model is starting to show some of the same signs of weakness that we've seen elsewhere. And that's because exports to China are slowing. Germany is behind the curve when it comes to digitalization. Energy prices have gone through the roof. And that economic dislocation is leading to the same kind of what the hell's going on here that hit the American working class earlier. Okay, now we have Arabella. Yes, hello, uh, Professor Kupchan. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, my name is Arabella. I'm a Yonsei student, at graduate student at the um, School of International Studies. My question is about, um, you spoke about Biden's engagement with allies and um, I think it's termed mini-lateralism. And I was wondering about this sort of shift from multilateralism to minilateralism. What are the implications of that on, on the world stage and, and especially um, for the future of the UN system? Thank you. All kinds of, of um, stray forces at, at work in, in what I might call the reconfiguration of multilateralism. Uh, one is that the American appetite for formal institutionalized multilateralism has shrunk dramatically. And that's simply because it would be extraordinarily difficult to get two thirds of the Senate to ratify anything. You know, if we if we took the post-World War II bargain, the UN, NATO, Bretton Woods institutions, and we took it to Capitol Hill for ratification, they would chase us off the grounds with baseball bats. None of it would, none of it would pass. 
And that's because that sort of, of, of institutionalized multilateralism has effectively been rejected, particularly by, by Republicans. And that's why most of what the United States does these days are executive agreements. The Paris Agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, this recent, um, uh, you know, the uh, it's all it's all done through resolutions and executive agreements. Second thing that's happening is that I think the U.S. is realizing that it needs to bring new players into the tent. The Quad is a perfect example of that. Now we seem to be brokering a deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. So you're seeing all this kind of ad hocery. I wouldn't go so far to say that we are in a post-alliance world, but I think we're in an alliance plus world. Well, you're, you are still have these fixed alliances, the NATO alliance, US Korea, US Japan, US other countries, but on the sides, you're gonna see a lot more mix and match, a lot more ad hoc groupings formed as needed by putting at the table the players that need to be there. And then the final comment I'd make is that, um, you know, if in fact we're gonna be living in a world that's, that's polarized, a new era of geopolitical division. The big, the big multilateral institutions may be, may be hamstrung because the Security Council is paralyzed. And one of the things that I don't know yet, but it's, it's very interesting to keep an eye on, are we going to see the standing up of credible parallel institutions that attempt to root around the West, the BRICS plus, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I'm, my best guess is that yes, that's going to happen. And then you will have swing countries like India that try to have it both ways. They wanna be in the quad, they show up to the G20, they come to Washington, for a state dinner. And then Modi gets on a plane and he goes to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the BRICS meeting. Right? They, they, they're going to play both sides of this. And they should. If I were in India, that's exactly what I would be doing. Okay. Now, Professor Mansur Lee of Korea Military Academy. Hi. Uh, my name is Mansur Lee. I'm a assistant professor in political science at the Korean Military Academy. Uh, I missed the uh, earlier part of your discussion because of other meeting. So uh, I'm sorry if I repeat your discussion. So my question is, when U.S. shifted its focus on domestic rebuilding, it tended to create more cooperative relations with its regional adversaries not global, but regional adversaries. So right now, today, the macroeconomic situation of the United States is facing some risk of uh, stagflation because of the Fed rate hike, and as well as uh, US Treasury bonds is also hiking. So do you think, uh, based on your insights, do you think that, uh, is there any chance that the next U.S. government try to improve its relations with North Korea while acknowledging North Korea's nuclear capabilities. Um, are you referring to the the current administration, the Biden administration? <laughs> no, no, either Biden or Trump or you know the next U.S. government. Straightforward answer: I don't know. Um, uh, best guess. Not ready for that yet. Um, and I, 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 you know, my what my crystal ball tells me is that 
whether it's Biden or somebody else, the U.S. has has so many major balls up in the air right now that particularly difficult problems are going to be put on the back burner might be too um, explicit a word, but they're going to be managed and not resolved. <laughs> and that's because I, you know, I think that the, that right now, Biden, for example, he's a bit overwhelmed, right? We've almost got World War III in Ukraine. China is breathing down his neck. He's trying to avoid a new war with Iran, which is about this far from <laughs> developing nuclear weapons. North Korea already has a nuclear weapon. And so I think that when it comes to Iran, when it comes to North Korea, when it comes to Palestine, Israel, I think they will be in management mode. You know, do no harm. Don't let this blow up. But we're probably not going to be able to solve it. Okay, Maria. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Kupchan. Uh, it was a great pleasure to learn about the U.S. politics and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, from this lecture. Uh, my name is Maria Pankova. I'm an exchange student from Yonsei University. And my question is, do you consider active participation of U.S. in Taiwan issue as a possibility to provoke China or on more brutal and radical actions regarding uh, the island? Uh, thank you for your answer in advance. I mean, I think that, that uh, U.S. policy toward toward Taiwan is about right. That is to say, to make clear that it would defend the island if it were attacked by China, but in some ways a little bit like my answer to, to Professor Lee, not to rock the boat, to manage the problem, even if they can't solve the problem. Uh, and I think that the best course for both China and the United States right now when it comes to Taiwan is to kick the can down the road. And in some ways, the the if there is an independent dynamic that could that could make the situation more uncertain, it, it, it could be the the politics inside Taiwan with an upcoming election there uh, and the possible change in the views of the Taiwanese government toward, toward China. Um, I, I also think that it would be preferable for the United States to try to avoid particularly provocative actions. I don't think it's, I don't think it's helpful that one delegation of congressmen and senators after another want to go visit Taiwan. I understand why, right? It, it plays into domestic politics and standing up to China. But right now, I think the Taiwan issue is one that requires cooler heads to prevail. Problem needs to be managed. Uh, because it is a very dangerous situation. Elizabeth, do you have any additional question? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, please, go ahead. We have just, you know, uh, five minutes left. You know, therefore, I will have, I will take just, you know, uh, in addition to Elizabeth, I will take one more question and I will adjourn the class, okay? I was just wondering because while you were answering my question, you talked about liberal populism, and then you talked about the center party staying at the center. And I do not agree with that statement when it comes to Germany, because, um, but I think it's more due to 
mostly U.S. people having a very different political spectrum than we have in Europe or European countries have. Um, because in Europe, we straight just call it right populism, even like extreme right populism, especially after uh, AFD. It's for us, it's just a straight up strong right populist party. And right now we also see developments in Germany that all of the center parties are going to the right. So um, you're maybe familiar with, we have the CDU and the FDP, and both of them have strong opinions that go to the right. Um, and I think it's mostly due to them just knowing that they will have more voters on that side. All of the policies they're implementing, especially these days, in regards of migration, wealth, or um, social like um, weather policies, all of them are so, for us as Germans are very problematic. Um, all of the like speeches, the rhetoric they use, it's very much 1933 for us. It's very concerning. So all of the center parties we have go more to the right. Just a comment as a German, it's very different, of course, but it might be a nice addition. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um... I, I take your point, I, and I'm, I, I refer to illiberal populism, not liberal. Po <laughs> I, I think there is liberal populism, but that for me was was sort of Barack Obama. Uh, illiberal populism is, I think, what you and I are both both talking about. My one perhaps qualification to what you said is that yes, you know, Christian Democrats in Germany center right in Finland, I mean, they're all moving to the right in part because they're scared of the right. And they feel that they need to inherit, grab some of their agenda to prevent voters from defecting to the far right. That's that's happening. But I also think that in Germany, for example, CDU, CSU, Liberal Democrats, Greens, Social Democrats are still in the realm of, of civil, decent, semi-centrist politics. And maybe because I'm comparing it with what's happened here, where you, you go and you talk to some, you know, somebody who used to be a, a normal human being and and they tell you that, you know, Trump won the election and that Biden stole the election. And and it's like, you know, what planet are you living on? That's that is not yet happening in Germany. Thank God. <laughs> OK, if you do not have any additional question in our in a close this, this session, Professor Kupchan, thank you very much for your really wonderful speech and, you know, very kind answers to questions from the floor. And we, are, we are, will be in a turning this live streaming into an edited YouTube version and we'll share with a wider audience. And we are hoping to have a publication in both Korean and English uh, when this lecture series is over. If we are aiming at sometime uh, July next year. I again thank you very much for your willingness to join us and very, very useful lecture for all of us. Let us give a big applause to Professor Kupchan. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Moon. It's been my pleasure to join you. It's very nice to see you again. And as I said, I hope, I hope we see each other in person sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Bye-bye, class Take adjourned. Care. I hope Bye. you can join next class too. We'll be having, uh, next we'll be in the offline, you know, Walter Mead of Hudson Institute will be coming to Yonsei University. He'll be giving a, uh, in an offline lecture, direct lecture. I welcome all of you to join us for the next lecture. Thank you very much. Bye bye.